Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, as part of this year's Senior Scholarship Conference, today we're talking to Lord Dola Popat. Ennobled in July 2010, Lord Popat later served as a government whip and spokesperson for the Department for Business, Skills and Innovation and the Department for Transport in the House of Lords. Currently, he's the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Rwanda and Uganda. Right, so Lord Popat, thank you for joining us today. How are you? How have you been finding lockdown? Actually, you won't believe I'm, I'm enjoying it because I'm able to do more work. Uh, the output is a lot more. Um, you know, it saves two hours traveling to the parliament, which is good. And, but obviously the work is a lot more because we're putting new bills in, um, constantly on COVID, on, on Brexit and all that. So that way we're very busy. We normally work Monday to Thursday, but lately we're doing Monday to Friday. So it's five days a week instead of four days a week. Okay, wow. That, it sounds like it's been quite intense recently then with lots of different government business coming through. Correct. I think my volume is playing up. Bear with me for a minute. So, yeah, I'm okay now. Yeah. No worries. So, sorry to throw you in at the deep end, but first question. Could you perhaps start by providing us an insight into your own experiences of race in the UK? Well, I want to start by giving all of you of my journey to this country and my own experience. Um, in fact, uh, I, I came from Uganda as a teenager, uh, bitten and tortured, you know, the brutal dictator Idi Amin, and you must have heard about, Omid has heard a lot about it as well. Um, so there are 45,000 Ugandan Indians or Ugandan nations kicked out of Uganda. Of that, UK took 28,000, gave them a very warm welcome. Um, you know, France took 2,000, Norway, Denmark, Canada took 5,000, predominantly Ismaili Muslim, so um, that was an experience I had in 1971. Um, and I started as, as a waiter, as a wimpy bar waiter. It's the best job I've done on it, by the way. That's why I learned how to speak English. Um, so, I mean, the point is that if, if you come to this country, if you can speak English, you can make it, you know. Of course, other things as well, integration, education. This country provides huge opportunity for people who come as immigrants here. Um, and Race was a major problem in the early 70s, but it's a lot less now. We haven't eradicated, but it's gone down substantially. I think 80% is gone. When people saw me in those days with my color skin, uh, they called me Paki, and that's no longer the case. We don't hear that anymore. Okay, and um, I think it's good to hear kind of the differences that you've experienced and the changing nature of racism in the UK. Are there any key moments you would point out as where something changed, whether that came from a government or possibly um, any other kind of group? Well, I think we, we have, I mean, we have so many legislation on race relation to protect the minority, to protect people of different color, of different disability and so forth. And I think the government, both parties, Labour and Conservatives and the Liberals as well, are doing as best as they can. They're promoting their party within people of this country, regardless of the race. Um, you can see we've got four cabinet ministers of Indian origin. So you can see the differences concerning parties made in many ways. Uh, in my days in, 70, in 78, 79, when I joined the party, um, you know, if I went for one of the events, I was probably the only colored person there. And it made me sit at right at the end. And you see people on my left and right not happy sitting next to me. That's no longer the case. That's interesting. And you spoke about kind of how there was an 80% improvement so far. Do you, what changes do you think are needed at the moment to kind of improve race relations? I think, you see, what can the government of this country do to improve? Uh, put it this way, if you want to clap hands, you need two hands. So it's just not the government and institution to help you improve race relations. It's the people Immigrants here has to work as well to improve race relations as well. So if you work hard, if you speak English, if you integrate, if you take the pushes available, you make more contribution to the treasury than you ask for, all this makes, makes people respect you. I mean, the British Indians are a lot more respected now than they were 30 years ago. Uh, and they worked hard, and they made a difference. They, they changed, they accepted and respected British values. So, this change has to come from more from the immigrants rather than from the, from the country. 
So I, I suppose it's interesting because your seems to suggest, which I, th I think we would, would all agree, that it's the government can only act so far and then it's the role of society. And, and as you say, two hands have to clap. You can't just clap with one hand. Correct. So as a politician, what role do you see public activism? I mean, for instance, such as the emergence of the, the Black Lives Matter movement playing in instigating such social change? Well, with COVID-19, this is unprecedented time with uh, lots of tension. Um, whilst I welcome the movement and support the cause to remove racism of any kind in this country, uh, we should be tolerant and peaceful in our, in our protest. And, um, you know, we, it's also by quite often educating people uh, through media and others to say why Black life matters and, and the difficulties the Black community or people of color community have gone through in the 60s and 50s and 70s. Um, we live in a new world and um, with, um, with pandemic, uh, the world will change even further. Completely, and I think, do you think the pandemic will have a specific impact on race relations or do you think it is more a generalist kind of, do you think it's not gonna have a big impact? Uh, two things, with the pandemic, will it improve race relations? Well, you can see uh, the, the frontline staff in National Health Service, in our social service, 70-75% uh, of people have other races. So it shows that they have been at the forefront taking risk of their own lives to serve others. Uh, and that will really improve that, listen, we need this community, a uh, great asset to us. Um, that's one side of the story. The other side of it is that key to uh, having a good race relations, integration by the the immigrant community and of course we've not been able to socialize or go out or have meals or go and watch football together that hasn't happened so connectivity has not been there with between the host community and the immigrant community that connectivity was very very important post-covid okay the connectivity you speak of how do you think we can work towards reclaiming this how can the pandemic maybe give an advantage to reclaiming this connectivity whether that means easier meetings by Zoom, or such ideas. So yeah, I mean, so can you ask, can you repeat that question again? Sure, so the pandemic has obviously brought challenges for integration. As you said, you can't go and watch football together. But do you think there are any advantages coming out of the pandemic with regards to integration? Possibly, you know, we're having a Zoom call today and it makes it much easier to meet and discuss them. Do you think that might be an advantage? Well, pandemic has been a challenge to every family, so. It hasn't helped in terms of uh, race relation or integration, you know. Um, I mean, for example, I normally have International Women's Day and we have people of all races speaking in Parliament every year. Well, this year we had uh, International Women's Day uh, on Zoom. And normally we are allowed to bring 150 guests in the Parliament. This is where non parliamentarians speak on the subject of International Women's Day. This time we had it virtually, and you know, um, we had 3,000 people right. listening to it from Singapore, from Australia, from Canada, from Los Angeles, from Vancouver. And this was our two o'clock time, so it was five in the morning for them. So, in many ways, things of that nature has helped a lot. You know, uh, more people were able to participate in this particular event that I have a year in the public. So it's, it's interesting we're talking about social integration um, and, and, and your book, um, A British Subject, How to Make It as an Immigrant in the Best Country of the World, has recently come out. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about the book, please? Well, in fact, I wasn't thinking of writing the book. I was basically, I didn't want to indulge myself or show my profile or have the ego of who I am and what I am and why am I. I had no intention of writing the book, but there were very, very many friends or parliamentarians convinced me to write, including the Prime Minister, and you can, I don't know if you've seen the copy of the book, and George Osborne, who did a very good, uh, the Prime Minister did a very generous forward on the subject. But there is, the, the purpose of that book was mainly for the new immigrants. If you come to this country, if you work hard, if you integrate, if you um, have this social gathering mix and all that, and respect the value of this country, and take those opportunities available, then you can make a success in this country. This is an amazing country we're living in. There's no country as good as ours, um, no matter where you go in the world. 
So that made me write the book for the benefit of those new immigrants coming to this country. That's genuinely very interesting to hear. And you spoke about your career, um, how you moved from kind of, how you built your business. Do you think Britain suited that kind of dream and aim of building a beer business and entrepreneurship? I mean, my, sorry, my sound is a little dodgy here. So just um, um, give me one minute. I'll just um, ask, can you repeat that question again? Sure. Um, so your career before politics was in business and you helped build a very successful business in the UK. Do you think the climate and the political situation in the UK helped you achieve that? You mean my success in the business, is it? Yes. Yes, of course, yeah. I mean, as I said earlier, there are huge opportunities available. There's access to finance in this country that many countries, many people, entrepreneurs in other countries don't have. Um, you know, we as a country encourage foreign direct investment as well. So all these things um, can make you a very successful entrepreneur. I mean, early 70s, quite often the bank managers were reluctant to lend money to a colored person. That's no longer the case. In fact, um, I did business finances, my business at one time, corporate finance. And I found the English bank managers would probably lend to an Indian than to uh, an English guy because they knew they'll work as a family together, make a success of the business, and repair the bank. Um, so post COVID, there's obviously been a bit of a challenge regarding business. Um, how do you, how optimistic are you for the future of business in the next decade or so? I mean, COVID has obviously changed the world. In effect, the world will not be the same and should not be the same. So COVID has, in many ways, um, give us a new sense of direction in every area, in, in social gathering, in business, in, in politics and all that. Um, how has COVID changed? Obviously, we are going through, a, we are, we'll be going through a recession. And uh, in many ways, I say in my book, recession is a good time to clean out as well. So hopefully it doesn't happen. But uh, we have to recover from the recession, support um, British businesses, which Rishi one of the Chancellor has done a number of schemes to help them out, including furlough in September. So I think we, we you know, we, uh, I don't know how to put it, but if I put it in medical terms, um, our economy needs a ventilator immediately and not parasitic. You see, it's interesting because we were, we were talking earlier about the difficulties that the COVID pandemic has brought for, for people to have inclusivity. And then we were kind of trying to draw out potential, the, the potential positives. Do you think there are some positives? And you say it's, it's a good time to clean out. But going forward, do you think that actually this could be a, a starting point for, for new ventures and for new industries uh, coming out of the, the COVID pandemic? Well, in fact, um, yes, you know, post-Brexit, post-COVID, the UK must behave like a business, it's important. You know, we use the phrase um, global Britain. Um, uh, global Britain is fine idea, but it should not be a slogan. And hence the Prime Minister launched the, uh, the, uh, the review yesterday, how we're going to go forward uh, with, uh, in terms of trade and investment. So I think we, we have more opportunities now post-Brexit than we had. Uh, we're signing trade deals with a large number of countries now. Uh, we are more flexible. Um, we're not um, dictated by Imperial Brussels anymore. So we will, you know, we are, our people are very resilient, Tom, you know, and, and you will see how we overcome this crisis. And so moving to your political career, um, you were the first chairman of the Conservative Friends of India. Um, what role do you think the group has played in, in the recent shift in British Indian voting behaviour towards the Conservative Party? Well, the Conservative Friends of India, in fact, I founded with David Cameron and now is jointly chaired by Reena and Hamid Chogia. Um, and it's made a big difference in, in political alignment with India, as Britain with India, but more important, British Indian community to encourage them to join the political process of this country. Now, joining political process is not becoming a councillor or an MP or joining the Great House of Laws, but joining the civic duty of this country, for example, becoming a school governor um, or uh, justice of the peace, you know, 
working with the local association so that integration you know with these other organizations key and i think that's working very very well but more important is also concerted friends of india like uh, concerted friends of israel are there to educate politicians as well of who we are what we are and what our needs are for example our you know, we are 3% of British Indians are 3% of this population, but contributing to 7% of GDP. Now, that is um, a great achievement of this community. You see the lowest unemployment figures, the highest house ownership, the lowest prison population. You see literally um, roughly about 71, 72% go to the top 10 universities. So it's, it's a big change for, for the community, for the country. And that's really interesting to hear because Conservative Friends of India, from what I understand, isn't just a conservative group, but it also lobbies for all Indians. It's, it's more of a community than it is. It isn't just about the politics, as the name could suggest. Yeah, and the Conservative Friends of India is for all the British Indians, whoever wants to join. Um, and it's there to serve the British Indians regardless of their political affiliation. Thank you. And the last thing I wanted to ask you was about your current role as trade envoy to Rwanda and Uganda. What do you think the kind of future of trade is with Africa? Well, Africa is in fact um, is on the move, um, and Africa is uh, obviously um, referred as uh, you know, like Asians referred as tigers. Africa is referred described as lions on the move. Africa is a continent with huge potential. The current has got a population 1.3 billion. This will double to 2.6 billion. Look at, I mean, uh, I mean, look at the size of Africa, 30.32 billion kilometers, which is bigger than US, Canada, Europe, China, and India put together. With natural resources, you know, a very fertile land. I mean, um, and this trade annual program is making a big difference for us to trade and invest in Africa. I mean, I became trade annual for DRC very recently. And Democratic Republic of Congo has got 27 trillion, 27 trillion worth of minerals, gold, diamond, you name it. And um, so it's, a con it's richer than the U.S. as well, yet it's got the most poorest people. So we have some social responsibility to help them. At the same time, it's through trade and investment we can get people out of poverty and create the middle class that they need it. So Africa is in the move with huge potential. Yes, it's a young democracy. It's not perfect. Um, but you will see with the emergence of middle class, more highly educated people, Africa will change. Africa is frankly the future for us, uh, United Kingdom, because don't they like us, they love us, they look up on us, the common art of English language, judiciary, rule of law. Many African leaders were educated here. We obviously, sadly, we lost the president of um, Tanzania last time, Magafuli. The new president is uh, somebody from Manchester University. A lady. So, you know, we have so many advantages in dealing with Africa. And of course, our African diaspora are living here, uh, European, uh, Indians like me, and Africans themselves. So, all this will make a huge difference. But it is a continent, believe me, for the future for us to trade, invest, and even to go and enjoy holidays. It's interesting you talk about kind of cooperation internationally. Um, because there's lots of news stories at the moment about uh, richer countries that have a, a, an abundance of COVID vaccines and, and what can be done to help out countries that may not have the resources to be able to provide them um, themselves. Um, do you see that kind of cooperation as key to building those bridges that will be important for, for trade going forwards? Um, Absolutely, yes. Those are very important things. I mean, we support our African countries, and especially the Commonwealth countries, in many, many areas of education, scholarships, bursaries, um, uh, in sports, for example. We have got the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham next year. In every area we do support, we build bridges with them. You know, we now have, we never had direct flight London, Kigali, London. We've got now from Heathrow. From next month, we'll have London and Tebe, London. We've got an airways flight. And, and, important things to build bridges. I think our weakness is not having, uh, we are number one, Tom, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to financial services, we are number one in the world. But there are not enough financial services organization in Africa. We need to create them. There's another way of building bridges as well that we haven't done. Airline is one of them, but there's another way to build bridges. But you'll see it makes a big difference. That's why 
you know, they look up, up on us, they, they like us, they love us, they want to trade with us, but we're not there to trade with them. And one of the things on with our problem, we Brits here, is we have looked at Africa with a band-aid lens, a continent that's poor, that's begging for money, a continent where there's tribalism, a continent with civil war, a continent where there is dictatorship, but they're no longer dictators. The democracy is young, 50, 60 years young, whilst we are 800, you can see the constitutional crisis we go through on a daily basis. So you could go to give them a chance to grow and develop. It's very competitive politically, you know, very strong opposition now that they're never in. There's a free press, free media. So it's, it is changing. And I think I give credit to this country to some extent because we have helped them to change. It's exciting times. Yeah. So Lord Popper, I hope that was amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I hope everyone who's watching it has enjoyed it as much as we have during the interview. There will be a dis panel discussion on Wednesday for anyone who'd like to tune in at five o'clock with Lord Popper and two other social and political speakers. And please do bring any questions you might have. And all that's left to say is thank you, Lord Popper, for your time. It's been a real privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And please do email Amit and uh, Tom yeah, Amit when things open. I'd be delighted to host you and some of your friends. I think we allowed up to six people uh, for afternoon tea. You can sit in the chamber and experience first hand how our democracy functions. And if any one of you wants to become politicians, a good career to have, please, you know, you can make a difference. You can do what you believe in and you can sell this country and the people of this country. Well, Thank what you. a wonderful note to end on. Thank you very much. Thank you.